Good evening, everyone. It's great to see everyone here. Um, Michael Hathaway from the David Lamb Center, who's the, the who's hosting this event tonight, was just saying to me that it sound it felt like a big reunion, which is exactly what it is. So, that it's great to see all of you here tonight. Um, which is sponsored, as I said, by the David Lamb Center. I'm Karen Ferguson, a professor of history and urban studies at SFU, and uh, my co-presenter, Luke Clossie, <laughs> is uh, director of the New Global Asia Program, our co-sponsor this evening. Before I hand it over to Luke for our talk, um, at SFU we begin public occasions like this one with an acknowledgement that we're meeting on unceded Coast Salish lands, including those of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam nations. And we'd also like to add an acknowledgement tonight uh, that the history of Birkin Monastery that we're going to recount happened in Statlium territory, namely that of the Lilwat and Akwatkwa nations. Uh, we recognize that the pioneering story we're telling this evening is part of an ongoing history of non-Indigenous settlement in British Columbia. So I will pass it over to Luke. One night in the mid-1990s, police and ambulance responded to a medical emergency at a remote spooky shack northeast of Pemberton in the Coast Mountains. Bumping their heads against the low door frame, they were surprised to find inside a collapsed neighbor from down the road, being tended to by a dozen young Thai women, a 30-year-old German man, and a Canadian in his early 40s, both dressed in saffron robes, bald, beardless, and missing their eyebrows. This was Birkin Forest Monastery. The Canadian was the venerable Sona, a BC born and bred Buddhist monk from the Orthodox Thai forest tradition of Theravada Buddhism. In June 1994, Ajahn Sona relocated from the Sri Lankan Buddhist temple in Surrey to this shack on the Birkenhead River. There, with the support of his fellow monk, the German born Ajahn Piyadamo, he succeeded in establishing Birkin. This was the first forest monastery initiated by a Westerner in North America. The Thai forest tradition, part of the Theravada branch of Buddhism, has now spread globally to become the most successful Theravada monastic order outside of Asia. Tonight, we celebrate and contextualize Birkin Forest Monastery's 25th anniversary. For those of you who are new to Birkin and the history of Buddhism, Theravada forest monasticism, especially in its Thai version, is extreme Buddhism. It celebrates austerity, it treasures the strictness of its rules for monks, which prohibit not only sex, but even being alone with a woman, which prohibit not only wealth, but even touching money. Forest monks are utterly dependent on lay people for food, but are prohibited from soliciting that food, hence the importance of lay helpers called stewards. This is hardly a recipe for success in the modern West, which can be unimpressed or even suspicious of chastity, poverty, and dependence. Thus, it was unexpected that this has proved to be one of the most successful forms of Buddhist monasticism in the West, a surprise that's captured our curiosity. Over the last couple of years, we've enjoyed interviewing around three dozen people, but only when we began preparing this talk did we realize how hard it is to write the history of living people, especially when they're in the room, poised to shout if we make any mistakes. The Birkin Forest Monastery has relocated twice as it's grown. Birkin I, at a site north of Pemberton in the Coast Mountains, was followed by a move in 1997 to a location just outside Princeton, Birkin II, and finally the move in 2001 to its current location, Birkin III, in the Nicola Valley near Kamloops. Birkin III's current circumstances, popular, well-supported, comfortable, make it difficult to appreciate its early history. And we want to stress that even within the unlikely story of the westward migration of Thai forest monasticism, this was a particularly unlikely undertaking. Even some of the Buddhist pioneers bridging forest monasticism and the West struggled to conceive of the idea of a Western monk or to have any hope that a forest monastery could survive in North America. But Ajahn Sona knew the lay of the land. From his background in classical music, he knew that you needed a very large population to find an audience for something so esoteric and refined. He had spent years in Toronto, Canada's population center, but for this he looked west to Vancouver, 
which he called the most West Coast hip open to that kind of stuff. Before we dive into the Birkin story, we'd like to point out three ways in which the Birkin story is a strange story from a scholarly point of view. First, Birkin surprises scholars of Buddhism because of the behavior of its early supporters. Buddhism in the West has been a topic of academic interest for decades, and a number of patterns have been recognized. Western Buddhism included ethnic practitioners who had immigrated from or descended from immigrants from Buddhist-majority countries, as well as convert practitioners introduced to the tradition in places like Hip Vancouver's yoga studios. According to scholarly orthodoxy, each group has distinct goals and was independent or even oblivious of the other group. The so-called ethnic Buddhists use generosity and ritual to seek health, wealth, and a happy rebirth, while the convert Buddhists use mindfulness and meditation to seek psychological relief and a complete release from suffering. According to scholarly stereotypes, an ethnic Buddhist would be as unlikely to sit and meditate as a convert Buddhist would be to bow to a monk. As we'll see, not only did Birkin defy these expectations, it survived only because its founders and supporters behaved in ways beyond the predictions of scholars. Second, Birkin surprises scholars of globalization because of its setting. Birkin one grew not here in downtown Vancouver, but a 200 kilometer drive to the north in the Birkenhead Valley. Globalization is supposed to happen in cosmopolitan urban centers, not in redneck rural areas. This research allows us to delve deeper into the many diverse cultural manifestations and implications of the global British Columbia, and particularly the Asia-Pacific networks of the 20th century. We hope our study of Birkin contributes to the growing appreciation of what's been called the global countryside. Third, Birkin surprises scholars who think in modern rational terms because its story involves a statistically improbable number of coincidences. We're interested in history from non-Eurocentric perspectives, and Birkin's history makes better sense when we approach it from a Buddhist point of view, one in accordance with what the Buddhists call the Dharma. That takes into account the workings of karma and past lives. Unfortunately, these are largely invisible to us. If we were enlightened beings, we might be able to see past lives and tell a much better story. As the Buddhists in the room know, the kind of narrative no normally told by professional historians is laughably superficial. Considering the laws of karma and rebirth, our looking only at Ajahn Sona's current life is like writing a biography of Karl Marx that considered only a single day in his life. We're keen to figure out how to take a dharmic perspective with such limited sources, but it's still challenging for us to know what to do with the multiple odd trails, traces, and coincidences that we've found throughout this research, which suggest subtle forces at work. One of the most straightforward odd trails is the Birkin name. Birkin was named after the Birkenhead River, which was named after Birkenhead Peak, which was named after a troop ship, the HMS Birkenhead, which sank off the coast of South Africa in 1852. That wreck was famous as an early instance of evacuating women and children first, while the soldiers stood at attention and drowned. This is a discipline and equanimity that echoes with our Birkin. The HMS Birkenhead was named after the shipyards where it was built across the Mersey River from Liverpool. Those shipyards, in turn, were named after this Birkenhead Monastery, founded in the 12th century by Benedictines after the Norman Conquest. We like to call it Birken Zero. <laughs> Initially, my friend in Liverpool didn't believe me that when he, I told him there was actually another Birken in British Columbia. So where was it? The monastery was in the coast mountains near Pemberton, located among a cluster of four unwinterized shacks right beside the Birkenhead River. The property is on the Pemberton Portage Road, which stretches the 60 kilometers between the largely indigenous communities of Mount Curry and Darcy. And along this road is a place known locally as Gramson's, year-round population in 1994 of four a small group of properties among other tiny settlements along this road. 
It's an isolated place that didn't have electricity until the 80s, no landline phone services until 2000, and the road was very rough until it was improved uh, as part of the 2010 Olympics development efforts in the Sea to Sky Corridor. This is where Ajahn Sona and his fellow monk, Ajahn Piadamo, settled in 1994. The valley could be beautiful and awesome, but our interviewees also remembered its ominous and somewhat creepy atmosphere in the mountain shadow, as well as the bitter cold of the Arctic outflows from the Pemberton Pass. Elizabeth Lund, who lived for some months as a hermit herself on the river adjacent to the monastery, recalled the power of the Birkenhead uh, that's shown here at low flow, especially during spring runoffs, hearing boulders tumbling in the freezing cold deluge coming out of the mountains. The river's roar created a relentless white noise that could be crazy making and led to auditory hallucinations, especially for monks and meditators maintaining noble silence. The presence of non-human predator animals also contributed to the atmosphere. Wolverines and cougars with grizzly bears at altitude and black bears at lower elevations. It's safe to say that the valley attracted people who prefer to be at the end of the road. And those, as former steward Bo Klima put it, had nowhere left to go. The four neighbors in Gramsons included the Tewinkles, a couple living across the road on a hobby farm, a solitary man, Robbie, who lived next to the monastery, but kept to himself so much that no one seems to have known his last name. And Victor Prochaska, an engineer in his late 60s, a spiritual seeker, who lived down the road as a sort of monk, according to Mary Jo T. Winkle, living in a small hermitage he built himself off the grid. So the monks in their austerity and solitude were not unusual in the area although they were, they were extreme, again, according to Mary Jo, in the amount that they didn't want or didn't need. Beside the road and the shack property were, were railway tracks. According to Ajahn Sona, six trains passed within 50 meters of the shack every day, adding punctuation to the river soundscape. The train was a vital connector for the monastery. Ajahn Sona's mother would send care packages with the train crews to drop off, and the crew and passengers learned about the monastery, which wasn't allowed by their landlord to advertise with a roadside sign, when they saw the monks from the train, especially Ajahn Piadamo, who liked to meditate on the tool shed that was right next to the, the, uh, tra to the railway tracks. Beyond the tracks were the shacks, a grouping of, of a few small cabins built in the 50s for summer use by the highway crew. Some hunters might stay in the fall, but they definitely weren't meant for li winter living and were pretty much in disrepair by the 90s when the monks moved in. One of those shacks and a tool shed comprised the monastery. The shack had a loft where Ajahn Sona slept. Below, a curtain separated a small kitchen area from the sala. The shack had a persnickety wood stove, which Ajahn Sona had to tend through the cold winter nights. They glued styrofoam insulation to the tool shed by the railway track as living quarters for Ajahn Piadamo, who used heated rocks as his furnace. Ajahn Sona's parents brought up a summer trailer to, the, to house the steward, who before that had to sleep in the sala or in a teepee or off the property. When Bo Klima took residence as Birkin for one's first, or third steward, I should say, this trailer was called the Bo Hotel. Ajahn Sona's cousin, George Robinson, first gave them a container and rope for refrigerating food in the river, but the power of the current meant that, meant that these and the food inside were lost from time to time. We were surprised to learn that the monks weren't always alone at Birkin One. The other three shacks on the property were rented intermittently by a group of gay and lesbian weekenders who had chosen this setting because they wanted to keep them to themselves not be peeped on by the curious children of visiting Sri Lankan families. This was a source of tension that Ajahn Sona resolved with Dhammic wisdom and equanimity, disarming the neighbors who had been ready for a fight. So now that we've set the scene, how and why did Ajahn Sona establish the Birkin Forest Monastery? He didn't just happen upon this obscure and eccentric place to found Birkin in 1994, in fact, he'd lived there before for about five years between 1983 and 1988 as a lay hermit, living and practicing on his own. 
But of course, that fact begs more and more questions about why he went there as a hermit in the first place, questions that stretch all the way back to his childhood and probably lives before this one. We can't really do justice to this prehistory today, but there are four qualities and aspects we'd like to share with you about Ajahn Sona's pre birkin life that made him uniquely suited to building a forest monastery in British Columbia. The first of these qualities was his deep spiritual connection to the forest from early childhood onwards, leading to the mental and physical survival skills necessary to live in the coast mountains year round in an unwinterized shack. From the age of five, Tom West, which is Ajahn Sona's birth name, was wandering the forest, starting on the slopes of Burnaby Mountain, where his family moved to the post-war subdivision of Seaview in Port Moody. From then on, in his free-range childhood, he was in the forest all the time, because it meant freedom for him. He went wilderness camping, including in winter, with his maternal grandfather. As a preteen, he lived for a few years off the grid near Penticton on a dude ranch, and that's where he's pictured here. Um, uh, that, and it's a dude ranch that, they, that his parents opened near the Apex um, ski resort uh, near, near to Pen Penticton. And as a teen, he started deliberately experimenting with solitude, camping by himself on the then isolated Long Beach near Tofino for 10 days when he was just 17 to see if he could live with himself for that long. During these outdoor adventures, he had sublime spiritual experiences in the wilderness and even in natural places in the suburbs like Coquitlam's Como Lake that in retrospect for him point towards his future life on the path. As an adult, the forest continued to draw him in as he moved towards the Dhamma and a monastic life. In Toronto, while studying classical guitar and beginning to practice Buddhism, he started going on longer and longer and more intense winter camping trips with a friend in a kind of unconscious mental and physical preparation for when the time came that he was fully disenchanted with urban lay life, returned to BC, and became a hermit near the Birkenhead River. The second background characteristic about, about Jajan Sona is that he was a doer and a leader from a young age. In preparation for our first interview with him, we scoured the internet for any scraps of information we could find of, about him, including an obscure Malaysian website that claimed he'd been a champion skier and diver. We couldn't wait to tell Ajahn what, uh, which, what lies were being told about him on the internet. And, we, um, and we, as we all started to laugh about this, we realized that while he, we were laughing at these ridiculous fantasies, he was laughing that they'd found the, out these, these facts about his childhood and youth. In fact, he was a champion skier and diver. Indeed, he was a provincial gold medalist and a long distance runner. All the while, he was quickly becoming a professional level guitar classical guitarist while also excelling at piano and singing. By the age of 10, he was leading overnight trail rides at the Apex Ranch. In high school, he was a student leader, expert debater, an intrepid journalist, environmentalist, and anti-Vietnam war organizer, and a founder of the Meyerdville Place des Arts in Coquitlam, which remains a significant arts center in the Lower Mainland. This extraordinary talent and energy and mix of solitary and collective pursuits were just what was needed to accomplish the unlikely pursuit of forest monasticism in Canada. And uh, as an aside, the music and sports also instilled in him the contemplative discipline of practice, uh, diving, running, and singing, as well as a series of childhood bronchial ailments instilled in him a focus on the breath. The third factor is that before founding Birkin, Ajahn Sona was already an experienced builder of Buddhist centers and monasteries from the ground up through his repeated encounters with Buddhist teachers just as they were establishing themselves in North America and establishing communities. In these endeavors, he essentially repeatedly helped to create something out of nothing. His first encounters with Buddhism happened in the late 1970s and early 80s in Toronto while he was studying and performing classical guitar. This corresponds to the great wave of Asian immigrants to Canada in those same decades. He joined two communities of ethnic and Buddhist converts led by teachers who are recent arrivals in Canada. The first was that of the refugee Tibetan monk Zazap Tulku, and the second was the Zen Lotus Society led by Samu Sunim, a Korean Zen monk. Both of these monks would become uh, later would later become major figures in North American monastic Buddhism in their respective traditions. 
He felt a strong affinity to the Buddhist teachings he received from these teachers. In retrospect, he called the Tibetans my cousins and his Zen teacher and fellow followers, with whom he's pictured here, as my brothers and sisters. He was attracted to their enormous discipline, restraint, and their adherence to classical forms in an era when mainstream culture disdained these qualities. He was also drawn by their answers to metaphysical questions that Western philosophy hadn't addressed for him in his studies at SFU as a university student. And of course, this was before um, Professor Clossy's Global Asia program in which Ajahn Sona's uh, <laughs> history actually plays a prominent role in the introductory course. So yes, in the case of the Tibetans, he was attracted by scriptural study and their direct approach to questions of karma and reincarnation. The Zen tradition got, got him out of his head through its anti-intellectual focus on direct experience and present-mindedness. Significantly, both traditions emphasize breath meditation techniques very close to that of the Thai forest tradition, which he teaches to, to, to this day. In both cases also, he helped his teacher build, teachers build makeshift Buddhist centers from the ground up, renting rundown houses in Toronto, uh, in, including a former flop house in the case of the Zen Lotus Society, and fixing them up through the generosity and sweat equity of followers, both Buddhist immigrants to Canada and largely white converts. And of course, this is the pattern that he would follow as well in, in building all three Birkins. As he delved deeper, Ajahn Sona was exposed for the first time to the Theravada tradition and its scriptural canon in the ancient Pali language. Like many who are drawn to Theravada, he was attracted to following a scripture understood to be closest to the practice of the first Buddhists. This led to his growing conviction that in some fundamental ways, Zen and, Buddhist, and, sorry, Zen and Tibetan Buddhism were not what the Buddha had actually taught. At about the same time, he felt an increased sense of futility and alienation um, and, and a sense of urgency to find a way out of mainstream society, a feeling known in Pali as Samwega. And so he became, without a teacher beyond the scanty texts available in English at the time, a Theravadan. In 1983, he finally rejected householder life and left it behind in Toronto, separating from his wife and abandoning a burgeoning musical career that he'd been pursuing since childhood. As he put it, the door had slammed behind him and he could not undo it. So he returned to BC unmoored and with a craving, which is his word, to be in the forest. He became a hermit in one of the Birkenhead River shacks with only the Vasudhi Maga, the great 5th century Theravadan commentary on the Pali Canon, as his company. He really had no other option. He knew nothing of the forest monasteries in Thailand or Sri Lanka, including Wat Pananachat, the international uh, monastery established by Ajahn Chah, where he would later, uh, later train as a monk. And so he practiced and studied on his own for, as a hermit from 1983 to 1988. Early in this period, he met his first real living, breathing Canadian Theravadan, Kirti Senaratne, a Sri Lankan born engineer who was visiting his friend Victor Prochaska, Ajahn Sona's hermit uh, neighbor in Gramson's. Kirti, an early Theravadan leader in British Columbia with deep connections to the small but growing network of devoted lay meditators and visiting monastic uh, teachers in North America, was impressed by Tom West and his determination and commitment, and the two men discussed his ambition to ordain as a forest monk. This photo, taken by Kirti's daughter Shamina, documents this fateful meeting, which really plants the seed for, for Birkin's eventual development. At the time, there weren't any opportunities, or at the time of that meeting, there weren't any opportunities to ordain in North America. But Kirti remembered Tom West's vocation and alerted him in 1987 of a visit to the Sunshine Coast by the venerable Sri Lankan missionary monk, Piyadasi Mahatera, and Anagarika Damadina, the great Austrian-Canadian uh, Theravadan teacher, who was the mother of Theravada in Western Canada. So, for example, she was the teacher to Ajahn Pavaro, one of Ajahn Sona's uh, first uh, monastic uh, trainees, and, and along with many of Birkin's most senior lay, lay supporters. Ajahn Sona didn't know anything about either teacher before he met them, but during this encounter, he learned of the opening of the Bhavana Society, the first Theravadan forest monastery in North America in West Virginia, and moved there to ordain in 1988. 
The founder of Bhavana Society is the Sri Lankan monk Bhante Gunaratna, also known affectionately as Bhante G. He's pictured here with Ajahn Sona. Today, Ajahn Sona is primarily known as part of the Thai forest tradition, but he was first ordained by Bhante G, and the influence of this pioneering monk and his monastery, the Bhavana Society, is indelibly marked on Ajahn Sona and on Birkin. Once again, like with the Toronto monks, Ajahn Sona was with Bhante G virtually from the start of the Bhavana Society, literally to build the foundations of forest monasticism in North America. Incidentally, this is also where he was first exposed to what he would later jokingly call the Buddhist trailer park syndrome, later seen with the Botel. These improvised kutis on wheels provided critical shelter and are a symbol of the early tenuous years of forest monasticism in North America. The Bhavana Society would be a familiar place to Birkinites. It really established the model of bringing together both ethnic and convert Buddhists together in a forest monastic setting focused on meditation and the training of lay people and North American, not Sri Lankan or Thai born monks. This model, common in Western Buddhism, is actually um, a very new, distinctively Western form, first innovated by pioneers like Bhante Ji in the US and other forest teachers like Ajahn Sumedho in England. Ajahn Sona's ordination with two others at the Bhavana Society in 1989 was history making as only the second Theravadan higher ordination in North America. There, Tom West became Ajahn Sona. Sona is a Pali word meaning gold or dog, and Ajahn Sona would later refer to himself as the golden retriever of the Dhamma. Sorry, <laughs> the golden retriever of the Dhamma. Yeah. <laughs> At his ordination, Bhante Ji remarked that the sasana, or the Buddhist teaching, had not arrived in a new place until monks from that culture are ordained, are ordained in that place. In other words, Ajahn Sona was a homegrown founder of North American Buddhism. Ajahn Sona then moved to Thailand in 1990 for three and a half years. He left the Bhavanist society to be in a Buddhist country saturated in Buddhism, as he put it, and wanted to experience what he called the pristine Vinaya, or monastic discipline, in the hardest, most austere tradition of, the, of Thai forest Buddhism that had originated with Ajahn Mun and his disciple Ajahn Chah. At the Bhavana Society, they made compromises on the Vinaya, as we've learned they do in every Buddhist monastic tradition in the world. However, the Thai forest tradition is considered the strictest in that regard. Also, as a pioneering institution, the focus at the Bhavana Society was necessarily on even the junior monks teaching lay people. He didn't yet want to be a, a teacher, but wanted to continue to learn. So he moved to Wat Pananachat, the international forest monastery in Thailand, established by Ajahn Chah, and led at the time by his fellow Canadian monk, Ajahn Pasano. Ajahn Sona reveled in his time in Thailand, and he had no intention of leaving there. But while he was gone, Kirti Senaratne, the Theravadan who had led him to the Bhavana Society, had initiated the founding of the Buddhist Vihara Society in Surrey, the first Sri Lankan temple in BC. Senaratne was moved to do so, at least in part, by the example of Ajahn Sona, devo of his devotion and discipline in his solitary training as a hermit. They stayed in touch, and Kirti repeatedly invited Ajahn Sona to visit the Vihara, inspired by his example. Ajahn Sona finally accepted the invitation in January 1994, going back to BC just for a visit to the Vihara and to his family. By then, he had reached his fifth year as a monk and his independence from Ajahn Pasano, so it was a natural time to return to see his family and friends. At this time, Ajahn Sona had no intention of establishing a monastery, but had spoken casually to Ajahn Piadamo, a German monk of his acquaintance, of perhaps establishing a practice hermitage somewhere in the world. Ajahn Piadamo joined Ajahn Sona at the Suri Vihara, but it, wasn't, it didn't turn out to be the place for them. It was a struggle to follow the Vinaya in the strict way to which they had become accustomed uh, in, in Thailand, despite the support of Vihara members like Kirti and Dianya and Punya Sahabandu, who offered meals to the monks every day at their home in Surrey. Both monks also felt that the suburbs was an unconducive environment for their forest practice. 
After they visited the site of Ajahn Sona's hermit years, and somewhat against Ajahn Sona's better judgment, they moved into the Birkins shacks based on Ajahn Piyadamo's enthusiasm for the place. Um, I'd also like to note that while the Buddhist Vihara Society may not have been the right place for the monks to live, it would prove to be one of the keys to the success of Birkin from the start, providing a steady stream of generous Sri Lankan supporters who understood, unlike the native-born population, Buddhist or not, the depth of dependence of the monks on lay people. The final background element that I want to mention was the unconditional love and support Ajahn Sona received from his parents, Ralph and Irma West, and particularly his mother, with whom he's pictured here at the Bhavana Society before his ordination. Other than a period of worry that he had joined a cult while he was involved with the Zen Lotus Society, Irma actively supported his vocation in, and Birkin in innumerable small and large ways, starting when he was a child uh, by treating his existential and cosmological questions seriously, and starting at Birkin by putting down the hundred bucks for the initial two, two months rent at the Shack Monastery. This would just be the beginning of oodles of support of all kinds. Furthermore, Irma's vivacious, gregarious, and storytelling personality and her highly charged energy, at least according to her son, also may remind those of you, those of you who know him of the gist of Ajahn Sona himself. Who lived at Birkin? Besides Ajahn Sona, there was Ajahn Pia Damo, 11 years younger than Ajahn Sona. He's 29 and Ajahn Sona is 40 when Birkin I was founded in 1994. Ajahn Pia Damo had trained in Wat Pa Nanachat in Thailand after a challenging street punk childhood in Cold War Berlin. He's been described as gruff, not very polished, but our interviewees most remembered his kindness and gentleness. Where they perceived Ajahn Sona as more oriented to the community, Ajahn Piyadamo brought a young and energetic determination to developing his own practice. Once when Ajahn Sona left on a long trip, he left instructions for money for constructing a washing hut, but instead Ajahn Piyadamo had spent it on printouts of the Pali Canon, which had its own uses. Steward Joe Bowman would memorize long passages of Pali with uh, Ajahn Piyadamo. Ajahn Piyadamo was ascetic and would distance himself from the world. Having lived in caves in Thailand, at Birkin, he would also spend time in a cave, waging a war of wills with resident pack rats. Stuart Bow thought that a soup made of water and compost would have satisfied or even delighted Ajahn Piyadamo. Ajahn Piyadamo was also famous for his long-distance solo hikes. At first light, maybe 3.30 a.m., he would knock on the door of the botel, Bo would put a stack of peanut buttered saltines in his bowl, and he'd be off like an arrow on the road to Vancouver. A series of stewards served the Birkin monks. Only extraordinary individuals volunteered to live in such limited circumstances. Ajahn Sona likes to quote Socrates on the three types living out on the margins of society, the criminal, the insane, and the wise. Ajahn Sona joked that he was running a reform school for runaway altar boys. <laughs> Bo, the third steward, explained to us, remember that film Angels with Dirty Faces, where they're convicts, but they're masquerading as altar boys and not doing very well with it, just barely getting away with it. Trevor Armstrong, the first steward, seemed less motivated by spiritual aspirations than by a desire to elude the police that were searching for him. Joe Bowman, the second steward, worked down the road at a communal farm owned by Red, a, a train-hopping, union-organizing, left-leaning type who attracted hippies. Joe recruited his friend Bo, who became the third steward. Bo arrived with a strong aversion to commitment and to rules, but he did want spiritual assistance. After slipping into a kind of baptism in the Birkenhead River, Bo put on his best shirt took the five precepts from Ajahn Piyadamo and committed himself for a year's stewardship. Both monks were away when he moved in, so Bo spent his first five days alone in that trailer. He had little experience outside of cities and spent those nights terrified out of my wits to step outside in the middle of the night to take a pee. 
He would, wa- he would mark off the days and nights like a prisoner. This proved to be a great challenge, but also a turning point in Bo's life, and today many people in the Birkin community in Vancouver have benefited from his hard-won wisdom. Also resident was Elizabeth Lund. She earned a PhD at the University of Ottawa, where she had been introduced to Buddhism by Miguel Romero, a Mexican chemist at UBC. Like our other residents, she had been going through a difficult period, but had a powerful determination, soon fueling an aspiration to live as a renunciate. She spent about six months in autumn and winter in a trailer on a utility line clearing upriver from the shack monastery with a down sleeping bag, a broken propane heater, and two cats. She would later be recruited to Thailand by a visiting monk to become a Meiji, studying for 10 years with a number of eminent Thai forest teachers. Who visit it and why? Perhaps what's impressed us most about Birkin One is the diversity of the people who visited it. Sri Lankan families, Thai nannies, alcoholics, ski bums, Thai PhD students, university scientists, the monks' relatives, and many, many more. It's normal for monasteries to have connections with a very lay community. Miguel described even monasteries in Thailand as community centers, so to him it was natural that Birkin One would host PhDs and nannies. Priyanut Dhammapiya, a Thai woman writing her PhD in the SFU economics department at the time, emphasized the usefulness of this diversity. She said, someone has to prepare food, someone has to take care of something, and if everyone is a scholar, nothing will ever get done. (laughs) Which is funny because it's true. (laughs) Diverse visitors came with diverse attitudes. Ajahn Sona explains that, We were people who were the top of the social spectrum from the Asian point of view. And then for the locals from Pemberton and Whistler, we were like weirdos on the edge. This map shows the residents of members in the earliest Birkin records. Compared to the population of the places at this time, we have more Birkinites from the area around Birkin itself and from Surrey, and fewer than you would expect in Vancouver proper. Some visitors actively sought a real right effort to find and visit Birkin. Others arrived through strange coincidences that might be linked to karma. Vancouver supporter Judith Williamson's phone number appears to just have been found by Ajahn Piadamo on the side of the highway. One night, neighbor Arthur Hall read a novel about Buddhism, and the next day was taking his friend's horse for a workout along the river when he and his horse were startled by the sudden appearance of our two unruffled monks. Essentially, there were four kinds of visitors. First, some visitors were monastic. Distinguished monks from Thailand, like Achan Li and Ajahn Anand, spent time there, as did senior Western monks in the forest tradition. Second, the Sri Lankan and Thai visitors mostly had found out about Birkin through the Sri Lankan and Thai temples in Surrey and Vancouver. The Thai supporters, mostly women, would sometimes bring along husbands who came more or less voluntarily. The third category cuts across the ethnic convert divide to include the serious, so-called serious, highly educated scholarly practitioners, mostly from Vancouver, bent on the textual study of the Pali Canon, meditation, and even monasticism. This would include Kirti, the Thai graduate students, and Miguel and Elizabeth, who both had monastic aspirations. Fourth, most visitors were locals or acquaintances of locals. Some visitors just came off the road. A number of neighbors became regulars. Roberta Carson, for example, knew Mary Jo Tewinkle through yoga and then in turn introduced others to Birkin, her friends who were kind of bored and her children and grandson for whom it was a powerful experience. For the locals, the monastery offered a kind of acceptance and structured sociability that appealed. The monks could be found early every morning and evening, welcoming all comers to their daily chanting and meditation, and were happy to engage with visitors about the big questions of philosophy and psychology. As as one neighbor recounted, when she visited the monks at odd hours, she would politely ask them if she was bothering them. Ajahn Sona would always reply, reflecting the monastic ideal of equanimity, you can't bother us, we're monks. Local monastics, locals, monastics, and born Buddhists all interacted with each other. Uh, Priyanut even recognized Roberta as her mother in a previous life. Although this is a rural logging area, British Columbia had had such a global history that many of the locals defy some of our stereotypes of isolated areas. 
Mary Jo had lived in Thailand and Japan, and her husband Vim was a Dutch immigrant and judo master. Roberta went to school with Japanese Canadian students in the 1940s. So if this is a backwater, it's a very cosmopolitan backwater. The motivations for coming were as varied as the visitors. The main attraction was Ajahn Sona. Our interviewees recalled his charisma, his accessibility for different types of people, his gentleness and kindness, his toleration and pragmatism, and his ability to be intellectually seductive and stimulating. Human rights lawyer Judith Williamson had done many retreats with lay teachers at UBC. At Birkin, in contrast, she found very clear boundaries, but it was much more relaxed on a personal level. Ajahn Sona could also relate to children. Tara Kanangura remembers a game in which every time they visit it, Ajahn Sona would ask them to point out anything new in the shack, a game that taught her an enduring lesson about impermanence. Family was an important motivation. Ajahn Sona's mother, sister, and cousin came to support him. Roberta came in part because the monks were close to the age of her own sons. The Kanangaras came especially for their children, who had been born in the West, but couldn't really connect with what and how they were being taught at the Sri Lankan temple. Some came out of curiosity. Spurred by an article in the Peak newspaper, ski bums and lifties came up from Whistler in sufficient numbers that Birkin declared Saturday nights open for meditation. Some sought help, especially those challenged by past or present alcohol and drug abuse or by serious illness. One social worker from Vancouver's downtown east side would bring up his clients. Perhaps the most powerful motivation was the opportunity, opportunity to give donations, often food, which is one of the answers to the question of what made this a monastery. It takes more than monks and stewards to make a monastery a real monastery. The early morning and evening meditation sessions have happened from the beginning, and there would be chanting in Pali if visitors had Asian backgrounds. But we'd like to highlight, highlight four factors in particular, Vinaya, austerity, metta, and dana. Vinaya. One of the most unusual features of Birkin was its commitment to Vinaya, the monastic code. Scholars of Buddhism in North America see this monastic formalism as something alien that repels Westerners. Ajahn Sona, reflecting on his own trajectory, notes that this is very weird, isn't it? Because I'm a baby boomer from the hippie era, when it's all like, don't follow the rules, love and peace, and drugs and sex and rock and roll. And how does that produce somebody who wants the strict observance of the Vinaya, recognizing, he says, that freedom only comes from enormous discipline? Visitors were impressed by Birkin's pristine Vinaya. Judith had her first encounter with Buddhist monasticism at Birkin and was later surprised when she went to the Bhavana Society and saw its relatively lax Vinaya. There, for example, a woman could hand something to a monk directly. The two aspects of Vinaya most prominent to visitors were the restrictions having to do with eating and with gender. The meal restrictions left the monks obviously dependent. Mary Jo marveled that even if we brought them bread and peanut butter, they couldn't put them together. Others were cowed by the idea of a single pre-noon meal, but then they were energized when they found out they could survive on that dining schedule. Gender-related Vinaya restrictions were also frequent in our interviewees' recollections. Irma West quickly learned that she could not touch her son. Elizabeth Lund's access to teachings were limited because she wasn't allowed to be alone with a single monk. Although alien and challenging, in the end, Vinaya was deeply valued by the Westerners. Chongam Trungpa and Rajneesh's groups had been controversial in the media, and now, in the 1990s, the Catholic sexual abuse scandals were coming to light. Visitors to Birkin appreciated Vinaya as a practical guard against abuse. They also appreciated the flexibility in Ajahn Sona's practice. He dutifully allowed Robertus to snap this photograph, as she didn't know the custom of not towering over the monastics, Ajahn Sona had studied the, develop, the historical development of the Vinaya rules so they could be applied in Canada. He could see how the Vinaya tended to accept necessary tools but prohibit the superfluous. Thus, Ajahn Sona decided that snow boots, which were never discussed in the ancient Vinaya from South Asia, would not be allowed at Birkin, or sorry, would be allowed at Birkin, but not snow boots with neon lights. 
The visiting Thai monk Ajahn Lee was surprised that Ajahn Sona wasn't doing alms rounds, that he wasn't going to neighboring villages to accept food donations. In Thailand, monks always go on alms rounds, alms rounds, even in the depths of winter when the temperature can plummet into the mid-twenties. Ajahn Sona had to explain that a visit to the nearest viable settlement would involve a 24-kilometer round trip and that a Canadian winter's cold snow and ice allow far less mobility than a Thai winter. Austerity. Beyond the formal Vinaya requirements, there was an informal situational austerity that turned the monastery into a forest monastery. Residents and visitors lived in really harsh conditions with no comforts of any sort. It was just incredibly basic living. There was no heat, no running water. Stuart Bowe remembers the power of Birkin's sensory deprivation. He says, I would say that the granddaddy or grandmama of all addictions is the addictions to the senses. When suddenly you're in an environment where there's no singing, dancing, listening to music, watching movies, eating afternoon. Visitors were cold, hungry, sleep deprived, and sharing a world with rats, mice, bears, and cougars, what one Thai supporter called the bad things. They loved it. Lay reactions were very positive, but often for very different and even opposite reasons. The Thais found the austerity both beautiful and good for practice, reminiscent of both the ideals of forest monasteries in their home country, as well as those of early Buddhism. Elizabeth had been born in Salmo, a working class community in the West Kootenai, and found Birkin not unlike the camping she had grown up with. The Carsons grew up with working hard. Bill's family of 15 kids never went on welfare during the Depression, and so were also used to austerity. Miguel, in contrast, came from a well-off family in Mexico and found the austerity extraordinary. Miguel has remarked that people who only know the far less austere Birkin III don't know the real Ajansona. Metta. The deep connections between metta, that is goodwill, and a forest monastery in particular were pointed out to us by Priyanit. In the commentary on the Metta Sutta in the Pali Canon, 500 monks decide to spend the rain retreats in a forest on the Himalayan frontier. They displace the indigenous tree deities who retaliate it by harassing them with nasty sights, smells, and sounds. The monks ran back to the Buddha, who urged them to return to the forest, but taught them the Metta Sutta now to use as protection. So metta was emphasized by the Buddha himself as a particular defense for the use of forest dwellers. In the winter, already as a hermit, Ajahn Sona would have to catch mice and rats in buckets and then trudge through the snow for miles to relocate them far enough away that they don't return. He couldn't just leave them in the harsh winter, but would give them some food, some insulation, and maybe build a little house for them. This form of universal metta did not come easily to all Birkin's visitors. Roberta was, in her words, smacking the bugs when Ajahn Sona gently advised her to kill or harm no living beings. She thought, I knew a mouse was a being. Are bugs beings? The most dramatic application of metta came during one of Ajahn Sona's trips uphill back from Mount Curry when he was a hermit. To defend himself against a loose, aggressive, mentally unstable dog who lived at a logger shack along the road, he would walk with his bicycle between him and the dog's probable attack vector and cultivate protective metta. Twice he was able to walk with bike and metta past, undetected, but the third time the dog charged with fangs bared. Neither the dog nor the monk saw the truck speeding down the road that hit and instantly killed the dog. Ajahn Sona calculated the odds that a truck would come down an untrafficked road at exactly that moment at one in 6,000. Not impossible, he said, but improbable. <laughs> Dana. How did the monastery support itself? As we said, the monks were utterly dependent on unsolicited generosity from lay people or dana, a Pali word distantly related to the English word donation. At one point, Ajahn Sona's mother, Irma, counted some $700 in donations, and so she set Birkin up with a bank account and worked with Kirti to create a legal society which would allow them to generate income tax receipts. This graph shows the sources of donations, money, and goods recorded in the account book that Irma maintained. It shows the importance of both monks' families in particular. 
This graph shows the expenditures with the medical insurance for Ajahn Piyadamo towering between the more expected expenses of rent and food. Just as important as the donations was having people like the stewards on the ground to make sure the monks got what they needed. During the many times when no steward was present, it would be especially critical for Roberta or Mary Jo to step in. They would offer daily meals and find out what was needed from town. They too would have to learn what feeding a monk meant. Roberta remembers that her initial efforts, dropping off a sack of potatoes, weren't very helpful if the monks couldn't cook. Further afield, supporters in the lower mainland, the Thais, the Sri Lankans, and Miguel and Elizabeth, would set out early in the morning to be able to offer a meal that day. One group of Thais would go up once or twice a month in a rented truck. Nikki Barchese had just learned to drive, and driving in snow was a daunting challenge. But they didn't want to let the monks down, who didn't have a phone they could call to cancel anyway, so they bravely drove up. These trips they remember as fun and as adventures. Why did people give dana? Some associated it with an aspect of their identity. Those born Buddhists gave because they were Buddhists. Tissa Kanangara explains that in the Buddhist culture, that's, that's one of the things we do. It's not something we think about, you just give things. Vim Tewinkle had immigrated from rural Netherlands to rural BC, and taking care of neighbors is what country people do. They would have done the same even for non-monks in need. The powerful sense of the monks' dependence was also a strong motivator. The supporters had a sense that their ranks were thin, and if they didn't help, the monks wouldn't be able to survive. It was only when Birkin III was established that Nikki knew that the Thai supporters could relax without the monks starving. Dana supporters had varying attitudes towards donating with the goal of making merit for a good rebirth. Some Thai and Sri Lankan supporters in particular were in awe at this amazing opportunity to make merit by contributing to the establishment of a forest monastery. Priyanit described it as something falling from heaven to us. In Thailand, they might have been pushed aside by much wealthier donors keen for the best merit opportunities. Among Western supporters, merit tended to be a much more abstract concept. Uh, many expected nothing in return and could even roll their eyes at the monk's interpretation of dana. Consider yourselves very fortunate that we will accept your kindness. Over time, the two, moods, the two modes of giving, Asian and Western, converged. More recently, one Thai supporter was impressed by the white people in Kamloops offering huge trays of food. She said, Ajahn Sona, you are very good. You can convince them to do dana the way Thai people do dana. A few words in conclusion. In order for the strict form of Buddhist monasticism to take root at the Shak Monastery, a group of people with widely divergent backgrounds, religious and otherwise, had to intersect to serve the mendicant monks. These interactions didn't happen in the cosmopolitan environs of a global city like Vancouver, but rather in a rural and reputedly redneck place, where the Thai and Sri Lankan Buddhists who visited encountered a foreign culture and physical environment surrounding the fami I'm sorry, encountered a foreign culture and physical environment surrounding the familiar robes and rituals of a Buddhist monastery where non-Asian seekers from Vancouver and Whistler found a demanding and devotional Buddhism alien to the non-monastic and secular forms they might have known, and where the rural neighbors to the monastery were more ready than we might think to connect with both groups in ensuring Birkin's survival. Birkin I could be strange, unlikely, marginal, and precarious. Ajahn Sona referred to it as a house of cards to say the least, Flying by the seat of your pants, there is no economy here, there is no guarantees of nothing. No guarantees. During one of her early visits, Roberta spent the evening meditating with the two monks by the light of kerosene lamps. After the meditation, she mentioned that she couldn't really concentrate because a thought kept arising. They could just kill me here. Ajahn Piyadamo tried to comfort her. Oh, don't worry, everybody thinks that. <laughs> Our interviewees had an almost nostalgic fondness for Burke and One, for its austerity and adventure. But they also understood that monasteries have life cycles, and Burke and One was itself impermanent. The move to Burke and Two near Princeton, and then to today's location, made Burke and accessible to so many more people. But even at Burke and Two, the monks came within two days of being forced by a lack of food back to Thailand, where this enterprise would easily thrive. In Canada, Burke and One was revolutionary in a number of ways. 
To have a Canadian monk ordain in the West and establish a monastery in Canada is an important milestone in Canadian Buddhism. Buddhism moved east and Canada moved west and they met in the Birkenhead Valley. One phrase that echoes in our minds as we work on this project is Nikki Barkhazy's, who summed up Birkin One's spirit as back to basics. Revolutions involve returnings, and Birkin One went back to the basics of settler Canada in pioneering, and back to the basics of Buddhism in reviving early Buddhism. So that, that concludes our talk, but we have a few uh, thank yous to give. Um, thanks to Doris Tai and Michael Hathaway at the David Lamb Center, our hosts tonight. Thanks to SFU's New Global Asia Program, a co-sponsor. Um, this is Global Asia's first public event. Uh, next month, they'll have their formal launch featuring a number of speakers, including Ajahn Sona, participating via video. Thanks to Melissa Salrin and, and Don Taylor at the SFU Library, which will be preserving Birkin's physical and digital archives for posterity. Thanks to Esther Salman and Marilyn Lemon for their transcription work and research, uh, research assistance. Thanks to Lucinda Phillips of the Nequatqua First Nations for her efforts to trying to put us in touch with indigenous uh, memories of the monastery. And thanks to all of the people who have shared their memory with us in interviews for allowing this extraordinary institution to exist and for giving us a reason to come together tonight. We couldn't tell this story without you. Thank you very much.